what happened to my clothes? And Telly, why does my butt hurt? Welcome to the Fat Games Podcast. This is episode five of season three. This is the podcast of two indie game developers and their random ramblings. And today we randomly ran, rambled on about uh, what we have been doing with our game Kids of Carindale. Uh We've talked a little bit and about uh, Blair playing CS Stars and his experience I, with that. I think we should uh, title this episode Blair's Bias While Playing Sea of Stars. Okay, yeah, that's a perfect title for this episode, Blair. I, I um, kind of I, I shit on Sea of Stars a little bit. But I also called out the good stuff. I mean, I don't know. I, I, I'm i not going to get into it again during the intro, but y'all can listen to me be a dick well, about Sea of Stars. Listen, Blair, you're just rambling on about what's on your mind, and that's okay, right? <laughs> it's all People are going to hate us because I wasn't the biggest fan of Sea of Stars. I, I, I can see it now. And that's Okay. <laughs> what else did we talk about in this episode? Um, we talked about the as you mentioned. Yeah, uh, uh, we talked about a little bit what uh, what we did this summer, which is you coming up to Edmonton and us getting to work on the game together for a little bit for the rarity uh, that that is. And we went to GDX in Edmonton, and we talked about what GDX is. We talked about the recent uh, news about Unity's pricing model changes. Yeah, we get into that a little bit. And then, yeah, I think you also have uh, some, were you going to share some recent screenshots of Kids Can Do at the end of this podcast? or So during the podcast, if you're on YouTube, you will see some video footage of some of the magic spells. Now, there's no audio in any of this because I do not capture any audio. And I also want to call it the fact that none of this is necessarily finished footage. It's all pre-alpha. And I did the capture right out of Unity, so I was not doing it as not doing a full screen capture or anything like that. So uh, as a result, there might be some, you know, some some compression uh, uh, artifacts or something with the video. So do not judge this as a final version of the game as we show it. It's, everything is still in progress, including the background I'm showing. All right, what a nice preface, Blair. Now, on that note, let's uh, let's get to the podcast. Now, how's things going? Things are going good. We had a uh, pretty good summer so far. Like, I'm sure you got a lot of work done on the game. It's I've been noticing. Summer. I've been yeah, noticing. A... You've been sending me, you know, clips, screenshots. I appreciate it. Yeah. Um, we have, Gary and I, well, uh, yeah, Gary and I have um, decided to sort of I would say pause doing new content, at least for a few months, and just go back and start polishing everything we have. And I went this summer, I spent time polishing most of the 58 spells that are in Kids of Carindale and making new ones uh, and making them look pretty cool. So the higher level spells uh, really pop. And um, as Gary likes to say, Gives you the emotional reaction that you want. It feels good when you see it happen when you, when you see the spell get cast or whatever. Well, yeah. What I guess what I was telling you uh, in person uh, when you were up here uh, for that uh, for that weekend is that some of the spells they got to look violent, right? Because you are trying to kill enemies, so it's got it's got to really pop. It does need to pop and. Yeah. Just for fun, if you are watching us on YouTube, we are going to play some video of one of the spells that I just added as my background. So this is Kids of Carindow's effectively meteor spell. And you really uh, like space, don't you, Blair? I do on the video. So yeah, I've noticed that the menu also looks a little different. It seems like the like that looks like an even older um, screenshot of what the menus look like now, but I do yeah. notice that the blue is a little darker. We've redone the uh, combat menus based off of some mock-ups that Sandalo and team sent us. 
I didn't do his mock up exactly because I wanted very much the sort of Fantasy Star Four kind of feel to the menus, except a little more modernized. Um, but uh, sort of the layout uh, of what he sent, I kept, and um, it looks a lot cleaner. So yeah, we've spent a lot of time polishing, and not not just battles and magic and stuff like that, but environments. I've uh, been going through and editing all of the dialogue as well, tightening it up, cleaning it up. Uh, Gary and I have, um, for better or for worse, that will be up to you to decide, the player, I mean, um, have edited out some of um, the little more crassness of the game. Is that fair to say, Gary? I would say so, yeah. Didn't, didn't we mention, I guess, in previous podcasts that we've got rid of like the direct swearing? Yeah, there's no more swearing. It's yeah. all replaced with fake words. And um, so why don't actually you tell the story of uh, of Too Many Games uh, last year, last summer? So 2020. I'm pretty sure we've went over the story before. But yeah, basically one of the reasons why we got rid of the swearing is because like, well, once in a while, you know, like little kids will come and play the game at a booth. And it's quite kind of embarrassing, I guess, like when there's like all these like F bombs and 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 shit bombs and stuff. And the parents are right there, probably giving you like the side eye, right? So, you know, I, I like I I feel that this game ought to be marketed towards a uh, a younger generation, not maybe necessarily kids, but you know, like younger audience. And I think um um by kind of putting in in-game swearing it uh, it opens up our audience a bit more. Okay, no, that wasn't, that's great, but that wasn't the story I was thinking of. Oh, are you talking about that one scene where uh, someone came, sat down, and immediately took a load file and skipped to the part where uh, you first meet Jack the Lumberjack? Are you talking about that story? Yes, I am. Oh, my God. You know, the, so that was funny. Like I was testing the game probably like a day or two before, and I got to the part where you're in Google, and you're just about to meet Jack. So this gentleman comes and sits down, grabs a controller, and immediately takes a load file to that spot in the game. And what happens next is basically a... Uh, more or less a sex scene between Telly and Jack the Lumberjack, like in the original game. And then he kind of had this weird, distasteful look on his face. He said Everything was consensual. It's a consensual sex scene. Yeah. Well, it's, it's not like we're like showing like- Yeah, pixel, it fades to black. Pixelated it fades, yeah, fades to yeah. black, but yeah. <laughs> but it that says funny three light I, and wild hours later when it fades yeah. to black. I don't know, then I kind of gave you that look. <laughs> well that guy set down the controller and walked away it's like so okay yeah. we uh <laughs> it's so funny that that is... <laughs> i just laughed so hard when that happened oh, that's uh funny, we yeah. edit we we changed that though um it, we we didn't edit it too heavily though we um it was still suggestive, but we didn't actually explicitly we, we removed the like three wet and wild hours later uh, I think I said six romantic hours later is what I've changed it to now. And instead of Elmo saying, today has been a very gay day, he just says, what is taking Telly so long? Very suggestive still, but it'll for any young kid, it'll completely just fly under the radar. Yeah, I think I think eventually, you know, like we'll land on something that's fairly tasteful, but still kind of captures the air of the the story, what happens, and callbacks to the original content. Yeah, um, we should actually talk about the explicit drug use we have in the game and some of the more explicit prostitution references we also have. Because I was editing the dialogue for Natch Conegra and the uh, the forest when you hop in a canoe and yeah. basically smoke weed. Um, what... If we should leave that or what we should do, because the drug scene is kind of a big deal. Like, uh, I, I think it's important to relieve some of the tension that's leading up to that. And they just, you know, get high and hang out for a minute. Well, you know, maybe instead of calling it drugs, we just call it, we'll take this like medicine. Well, it's called Guija. 
So okay. I so mean, so they just call it Ouija. Yeah. So no, just don't just don't call it drugs, and then I think we'll it's never called drugs. Okay. Yeah. We never explicitly call it that. So <laughs> there's yeah, one piece of dialogue fun. that's still in there, though. Uh, what? so after that scene when they do the drugs, uh, Elmo wakes up alone on the beach, uh, and he's naked. So spoilers for anyone who well obviously have have no one's played this far in the game yet. And uh, he goes, he tries to go find everyone in his clothes, obviously. And uh, when he finds everyone, he, he there's this piece of dialogue. It's like, what happened to my clothes? And Telly, why does my butt hurt? <laughs> I think I left that one in when I was editing that. I wasn't sure if we should keep that or not. But Misha, right, let, me, uh, let, let, let me play. Oh, that's through. because of me. We'll, we'll play, <laughs> and it we'll play almost through says, a few oh, times. Okay, then. We'll play through it a few times. We'll see how it. We'll see how it lands. Sometimes, we're, like when you're developing the game and you're writing the script, it's not the same as like playing through it. And I don't know. I laugh my ass off that every end, time so. I every time I read this. What do we want to do next year with the game, man? So, so you pretty I, much I, dedicated this next little bit to polishing. Yeah, and I want to by I think February. That's a good idea. I think by February, I think we're going to be at a place where we're going to um have something that I'd be ready to show at Expos again and something that would resemble the finished product just without all the content. Um, obviously, we might tweak some stuff additionally as we move on with um, Eva's scenario. But I, I, it is generally looking very good. There's still some st some changes I want to make to some of the environments and stuff and to Poogle and just keep making things look nicer. I mean, our competition, if you look at games like Sea of Stars, which we will never look that good because we don't have that money or that team, but um, we aren't we aren't exactly ugly either anymore. And I think this is kind of also a response from all the feedback of being called ugly over the last, well, well, not really this year, but certainly last year. Yeah, so I guess it kind of makes you wonder if negative feedback like that works. I always was planning on making this look nicer. I guess I it what it forced me to do was make it a priority. Mm, I see. Hey, you know what they say: squeaky wheels get the grease. Yeah. So. Especially when I show it to people, I don't. I just don't want to hear it anymore. That people say, "Oh, the graphics aren't good." Well, have you gotten any new feedback from others? No one's seen it. I mean, I, I've shared it. I've shared videos with a few people here and there, and they've said this looks really good, including Sandalo. So this game is really starting to really come together, which is good feedback from your artist. <laughs> yeah. It's like, oh, yeah, I did a lot of this stuff. <laughs> it looks good. Well, it's like he doesn't see. Uh, I asked him the last time he played it. He said he doesn't have a lot of time to play the games that he's working on. So that's that's something. Well, you know what? That just means that he's keeping busy. Do you think you'll want to do Expos again next year? Or do you want to take two years off? Oh, so you're talking about, is there like a specific expo you're eyeing? I'm thinking too many games next year, because we're obviously, we're not doing MAGFest, but we will be there. Actually, I'm judging MAGFest. Yeah, well, we can talk about that in a bit here, but let's let's go back to, so what I'm hearing is that the, we might be invited back to too many games again. Well, I, it's a paid spot, so yeah, we can we can buy a booth. They wanted us to yeah, come this year, but we didn't oh, do it. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it was quite the experience that first time we went. I remember, like, uh, needing to, like, walk 30 minutes to grab food. Yeah, I mean, it's in the middle of nowhere. That part yeah. sucks. But it kind of seemed like a bit of a mini magfest. Yeah, I think, it like, it makes sense to have a car. Maybe we should consider. Yeah, that. Like maybe we should consider renting a car and driving out to Philly. Ugh, I don't want to drive, but I can drive. Mm. Well, it's more that I don't want to drive out of New York. I like that part kind of stresses me. Oh, I was just thinking, was considering like um, oh, renting, renting a car there. Oh, in Philly, yeah, that might yeah. be all right. All right, so Sea of Stars, or do you want to go to Magfest first? Uh, let's talk about Magfest. Yeah, so um, 
out of the blue, I just messaged them and uh, asked them, can I be a judge for MIVs? So that's the uh, MEGFest Independent Video Game Showcase. Um, and they said yes. So this year, I get to be the jerk judge who gives negative feedback about games, although I'm definitely not doing that. I'm definitely not going to give anything negative. Anything I say would be constructive. Um, I've also explicitly told them that I don't want to judge any games from Gumbo because I think that's a conflict of interest because they're all my friends and Valentina and Jonah and I think a few others have submitted this year. So yeah, that makes sense. Uh, you don't want to be put in a bad position. So yeah, uh, that, uh, said, that definitely makes sense. Yeah, and I told them uh, if I get any of these games, I'll just uh, ask you to assign them to someone else. So I'm looking forward to that because that'll be fun. I get to uh, apparently I'll judge ten games, so you know over the course of three weeks. So I won't uh, I won't be playing uh, any sort of other games during that time. I hope. When when does this uh, when does this judging happen? Uh, I think it's supposed to start next week, actually. Oh wow! Okay. And I don't know if I'm supposed to be saying this. Nobody has told me anything one way or another. But hey, if you're going to Magfest, now you got a little bit of information. Judging is starting soon. Did you buy your badge, by the way? I have not gotten my badge yet. I'm going to buy my badge today because I want to get in for the hotel lottery. Yeah, me too. I don't want to end up staying in, like, Baltimore. Yeah, that's not so fun. I mean, it's not guaranteed anyway, but... All right. Sea of Stars. All right, let's talk about Sea of Stars. So you recently bought and have been playing Sea of Stars. Yeah. What are your thoughts? I'm six hours in. Now, Sea of Stars was, again, marketed similar to Chain Echoes, like a Chrono Trigger kind of combat system game in that uh, when you run into enemies on the map, you don't go to a separate um, battle screen or anything like that. It's The, the fight takes place right there. This uh, game is more like Chrono Trigger than uh, Chain Echoes was because when you go to the overworld, you, it, it sort of has that zoomed out view where you have the miniatures walking around the map and it shows the name of the location. It's very much like Chrono Trigger in that respect. Um, I'm The game is visually very good. The art is fantastic. Some of the, light, the lighting effects that they've done in this game, I think I figured out how they've done almost everything. Because every time that there's like some sort of like day to night shift or 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 when you see the shadows move around on a characters based on the light source this was something i had actually originally started doing for kids of Dow, but realized that the effort for it would be too much so i just abandoned it but i i realized that they actually did it very much the same way i was doing it for Dow in the in the very very early days of development um so the the lighting effects in this game if you look at some of the trailers are probably one of the the wow factors that w w it really pops when you're looking at a you know a trailer for it, but um, in the actual game, it's it's kind of few and far between, at least so far. I'm only six hours in, as I said, um, so it's. I mean, so now that I've said all the visual stuff, the gameplay factors, um, I'm not really engaged by the story or the combat system they try to give their characters personality and stuff it's it just seems like it's targeted for like i guess a very young audience at least that's my impression of it um i just got to this point so spoilers if you haven't played the game where they find these pirates they're not like really piratey they're they're kind of like really nice people but they're called pirates and um the captain is called captain cliche <laughs> and i'm just like oh i mean i get it but i don't know i'm not in i'm not in it and it's not working for me yeah so it's a it's it's, it's a it's a tougher sell when you're uh when you're an adult i guess things you can get away with a lot i guess when you're playing as a kid yeah for a younger audience i think they would they would they would probably like that but I, I just find some of it a little okay. It's a little grown worthy to me, but um, maybe maybe I'm not the audience for this game. Uh, the combat, though, like there's aspects of it that are really good. Um, they've got like some of the spells that the main characters have. Like there's this 
basically it's a boomerang spell and you launch it at an enemy and it comes back at you and you can deflect it and it'll go and attack another enemy and it comes back to you faster and so on and so forth you can deflect it as long as you can as long as you can if you miss the button press though the spell ends and i that i think that's really cool oh that's a uh, so so you can go for as long as you keep uh pressing the button, the button yeah at the right time yeah and you can do some serious damage with it so it's pretty cool uh and then but there's some uh, some things i don't like um so there's a but you can press the press the button or like you know the action button at the appropriate time to either do an additional attack against an enemy or defend yourself when an enemy is attacking you and i find that it's really hard to sort of figure out what the appropriate time to do this is and the game was like oh don't make this a big deal this isn't the main attraction of the game it's just something extra that you can do i think that was them realizing that it's really freaking hard to get it right um but at the same time if it was super easy to get right as well i imagine then that kind of take defeats the purpose of as well um but i i just get frustrated by it because it is it's there's no visual indicator like it's um um you're you basically are guessing when the right time is like I think it would be better if there's it, a visual indicator tell you when to press, and if you didn't press in time, that's your own fault. But uh, are there any there's, other visual cues? There's a visual cue when you get it right when you press. Uh, I see. Okay. But not not when uh, not telling you when to press. And there's no consistency in the timing at all. Or? Well, uh, there's there's probably consistency when the player is attacking the enemy because you mm -hmm. have to basically press on the right attack frame. Mm -hmm. And when the enemies are attacking you, you have to press at the right time for their attack. But they have all these different attacks, and it's hard to tell what the right time is going to be for any given attack. And some of them will, like, their attack involves three attacks. So they have to press it three times at the right time to, uh, oh, to I see. properly okay. defend. Yeah. What would you say is your the overall experience you're getting from CSR? I'm feeling mediocre so far. Yeah. Um, the story and the uh, the combat is kind of turning me off of it. Uh, the combat's really hard and unforgiving. You die a lot, and um, you, you kind of get sent back. The auto there's not a there, there's auto save, but there's not a. I think it's too sparse. Um, I think uh, also we are a little bit better at this with with more auto save points, and when you're fighting a boss, we give you the option to just restart right then and there and even, you know, level up your characters automatically if you don't want to go back and grind. I think Kids of Karen is definitely an easier game. And it, it, it gives the experience that I would prefer out of out of an RPG than, than what I'm getting out of this. So, But I'm biased, yeah, so it, hey. It, well, it makes sense for Kids of Karen because in my mind, I feel that it's like a story and character driven game. Yeah. Uh more so than well, I'm assuming the developers of this game wanted it to be a story driven game as well. But certainly the visual element is key for this. Um and I, I don't I mean they marketed the 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 uh Chrono Trigger style combat a fair bit. So I don't know, I'm on the fence. I'll, I'll keep slogging through it, but I'm I'm not loving it. Not quite. I'm not hating it either, but it's certainly you know average. But you got the YouTubers saying how great the game is. So my thought when 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 I, I when earlier this year when I did the same thing with Chained Echoes and they're doing it again with Sea of Stars, my thoughts are like, how the heck do we get Carindel on this list? I mean, I think we still need to get further on in development and get a lot better screenshots out there and content out there on the internet because right now what we have is really old and even the uh, screenshot i have up on my background right now this is like an earlier screenshot of this one area it's very it's very bare um but it's uh so it's already it's, aged aged itself and it's already aged and yeah. i'm not taking any screenshots i i haven't focused any time on that i've been focusing on making things look pretty so we got to get on x or twitter whatever you want to call it and instagram and start posting more content again to get some interest if we can or, i mean our discord channel's dead so um do you have a feature i guess in any of the builds where you know like auto screenshot every like 10 minutes or anything like that 
No. I think that might help. And I need to fix our screenshot functionality that's in there right now. It's um it's not it's, something's wrong with it. I gotta I gotta fix it. I did it in a hurry when I did it, so yeah. Or maybe even just like have like a, a button that I can click on my controller. There uh, it's, on the it's on the keyboard. It's something it's yeah, I'm, I'm not I'm not playing it on my keyboard though. <sighs> so just just something quick, right? Just make it easy. It's gotta be easy, like the least path of have... resistance. I have well, tell me a gamepad you have, and I'll go and map it for that specific control. Because I'm not going through and updating all the um, all all the uh, gamepad profiles just for, to take a. Okay, so I got I got a Logitech. Okay. Map it to like L two or something, and then like as I'm playing it, I can just like click it and just grab a bunch, and then we can like have them. Yeah, I mean, that you got to be very intentional about the screenshots though because if you if you take it the wrong time you'll have one of the characters like facing the wrong way or one of them will be halfway through an animation yeah exactly so if i take a screenshot at the wrong time it's just like me having to like almost like take one of my hands off my controller go to my keyboard and like take a screenshot and then like dump it into a file and save it i just want to be able to like click a button and it almost gives gives me a file in a folder somewhere i would just love to have hire someone to do this shit because i it, it's time it's a lot of time that you got to sink into this it's marketing basically. no I, I i get it but that's half the battle yeah that's why having tools is probably the best yes. way to approach this yeah 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 okay fine i'll go i'll go and make those changes you win <laughs> Thank you. I'll fix, I'll fix the screenshot issue. That was computer. everything else with Sea of Stars. So you talked about graphics. You've talked about gameplay. Uh, you talked a little bit about the story, characters. I haven't talked about music. Yeah, talk about the music. Uh, but I like uh, it. You are a far better musician than what I've and experienced. Why would, you, why would you say that? Now, it could just be because they're going for a 16-bit style. So mm -hmm. they're, they're intentionally kind of you know, limiting what they produce for the music, mm -hmm. but I've just not pulled into it. Like the, the actual, the, the battle music got stuck in my head the other day. And it's like, why is this in my head? I don't even like it. Um, is there an element where you're just not letting yourself like it? Uh, so am I being biased? Probably. No, um, I'm trying to do some psychoanalysis here, Blair. Go for it. Uh, I'm, I'm probably definitely being a little biased. Uh, because I'm when I go play a new indie RPG, and, and again, this was it wasn't exactly super indie. This was, I think, the studio had eleven plus people in it, so triple I, if you will. Um, I do get a little intimidated because I'm worried that I'm gonna then go back and have a, a, an existential crisis and think how horrible Kids of Carindow is. So it's always very difficult for me to go and play someone else's RPG. But I forced myself to do it now because it's kind of important. But with that said, I mean, I think that you were a better, well, the music you produced for Kids of Care and Now, I think, is better. And again, again, could be being biased, but. Yeah. It's slightly you're being biased, Blair, but, you know, these, these things are subjective. So, oh. you know. Okay, well, to, go to, listen to, to some to of the music and, okay, you can't really probably, uh, You'd probably just then be saying your music's better than someone else's, which is kind of uh It would feel weird for me to say anyway, so... Yeah. yeah. I'm really shitting on Sea of Stars, aren't I? Well, in, in a sense, yeah. It's, it, it will sound... When you, when you listen to this podcast again, it's going to sound like you're negatively talking about Sea of Stars in many in many aspects. Um. Okay. Some of the good pauses about the uh, gameplay. There's a lot of puzzle elements. Some aspects actually remind me of Zelda. Like uh, when you get abilities, they're in a giant treasure chest in a dungeon, similar to what you'd see in Zelda. And uh, the uh, the level design or the area design is very well done. There's a lot of verticality to it. So you climb walls and stuff and hop up to higher platforms. Um, that is incredibly well done. So that's a very, that's a good, it's a big positive for, for this game. It's just the combat and the story lose me. And it's not that the music is bad, but it doesn't do it for me. What game have you played in the recent past uh, where the music has done it for you? 
And don't say Kids of Karen Dow. Of an indie title? Not much, yeah. but if you if AAA stuff, um Xenoblade Chronicles is really great. Ease, the the people at Falcom always make great music. Okay. And I, I haven't enjoyed a ton of indie music. I don't think. Nah, I mean they also typically tend to go for the kids of Karen Dow isn't going for a 16-bit or uh, aesthetic to its music or style of the music, so I guess. Yeah, I never, I never intended to. I don't, I don't yeah. want to either. I don't think we should. But limits us. I mean, like I had that kind of restriction back in the day, uh, where I was limited to only, you know, what I get my hands on, right? But I can almost do whatever I want now, so. You know, well, might as well just see what I can do with. I wonder that. if there'd be copyright issues if we actually, if I edited the podcast and overlaid the Sea of Stars battle theme and then put ours next to it or after it. Uh, I don't know. You might get a copyright strike. We'll try it, see what happens. Yeah. I mean, they, they probably like use AI to like help out with stuff like that these days. So, or maybe not even AI. There's probably tech to do it. In Probably some easy. regard, so I think they'll just uh mute the audio at that though, or, or so I don't know. We'll, we'll maybe we'll put it at the very end of the podcast. I'll put it at the very end, so people who want to stick around and listen to it, they can make their own decisions. But again, it was I think a lot of it was a choice in terms of the style they're going for. Mm -hmm. I just think it. I honestly think it's just an average game. Beautiful graphics, great level design, combat. Is meh and story is meh. All right, what else we got, G? Uh, let's talk about the summer that we had. I went up there and visited you. Yeah, you did. So it just so happens that uh, some of uh, some of the uh, your buddies from Gumbo were also up at the same time. Right. So, what was the event that was going on up there again? I think it was like the GDX conference or something. It was like an Alberta game development conference that was happening that week. And then they were also doing an expo at uh, K-Days, which is like a, an annual fair. So we got to check that out a little bit. And then... Uh, yeah, we, we were... I was coincidentally in Edmonton there. the same time as K-Days and this GDX expo thing. Um, which... It was great to actually be in a, the same city as you and work on the game together but uh let's let's talk about gdx because they actually flew all the uh, well, they flew sam uh jonah valentina yeah those three you know, just those three i believe they flew them up to um to gdx yeah they did yeah they uh, they got the shoulder game sorry there's a fruit fly just kind of flying around here if he mm -hmm. uh if he gets into vicinity, I might have to take out. You got to do what you got to do, Gary. Yeah. Um, the expo but anyways, was... I, I, yeah. Okay, yeah, you go, you go ahead. So at that expo, we saw uh, My Familiar, which was the same, which we saw at MegFest last, or I guess in January of this year. Yeah, and, correct. I, uh, I like that game. Yeah, and they, they're based out of Edmonton, right? I think that's what we found out. Uh, I thought they were based in the state somewhere. No, no, no. The, the, the development team is based out of Canada. Oh, then it was, it was probably Calgary or something. I don't know. Because I I was... I I mean, we played at a MAGFest. So when I swung by the second time at GDX, I asked them where their funding came from. Because they, these guys are obviously working on the game full time. They, they seem a little bit higher up than just strict indie because they've got you know, animated cartoon sequences in the game. And apparently some rich dude from Texas is funding the whole thing. Oh, yes. I I remember that detail now. Yeah. So like in, in my mind, I thought, yeah, their, their sponsor was based out of the States. The development team, I think, is actually based out of Minton. You're, you're correct. Yeah. So that game, I wonder if we'll see them at MegFest again this year. Um, but yeah, that game was there. And it's still looking really cool. I mean, it, it didn't really mm -hmm. look any different from, from what we saw at MegFest, but I think it was already pretty polished at that point. But yeah, like uh, while you were up here, I felt that we uh, got a lot done. Well, yeah, we started uh, really ramping up the visuals on um, 
on the combat stuff. So that's I was working on the skills and making them look pretty. Yeah, we gotta we gotta do more of that stuff, Blair. We do. When are you coming down here next, Gary? Uh probably January. The Magfest. Yeah. Same deal. Come to New York for a little bit, and then uh, we'll train uh, down. We'll see if I can take that week off. I can go to some coffee shops. Hopefully, not too busy and just. Yeah, that's true. Every time I come down, you're like working all the time. I last time I took the week off last year at Magfest. Yeah, we'll 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 see what the game is looking like. Um, at that point, then we can figure out if we want to go to Pennsylvania again or not. Yeah. I want to do PAX one year, not next year, but one year in the not too distant future as we get closer to launch. I think yeah, um, it should be fun, but uh, that's the, that's like a big one, right? That's like a lot oh, yeah. more people. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that's going to be. Um, we may also want to really up our booth and spend some money there and actually make something cool. I don't know where the hell we'd store it, though. How big are the booths at PAX? I, mean, I, I vaguely so remember you saying that they're tiny. Well, when I, the only time I was at PAX was a play crafting with Burgle's Bounty back in yeah. 2016. Yeah, I wouldn't want to, like, with I wouldn't do that again. I'd have a chair and I'd stand for eight hours a day. That was rough. But yeah, having chairs is extremely important. Remember yes. that too many games where like uh, they just went came like the, I think like one of the organizers just came and took their chairs away. Yeah, that was so weird. It's like you guys can't have these. It's like okay, don't worry, I got us. I went, I walked yeah. all the way to Target and I bought us two chairs. Yep, we still have those. Yeah, yeah, we we give the shitty stools to the people who play our games, and we sit on the nice chairs. <laughs> there we go. Maybe I should consider getting like seat covers for those with like. Carrying well, stuff printed on them. Oh, that'd be cool. Well, one of them's already damaged anyway, so. Yeah. Perfect. <laughs> so, have you heard about this Unity stuff? I saw on Reddit, yeah. So, um, correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems like uh, Unity is now going to be charging, uh, I guess, money per download or something. Or per install, per, yeah. Per install, yeah. Uh, they don't start till after 200,000. Okay. So, I mean, so I was, I did some math, um, on this yesterday. And so if we, Kids of Carindow had 200,000 installs and our price point was $25, which is what mm -hmm. I think it will be, that's $5 million. And they do a two cent charge per install based off of what they've got published. That's forty thousand dollars. So on top of that, the publisher, if we assume we're going to have one, and the app stores are going to take their share. So uh, Steam, you know, the consoles, um, and then we get whatever's left over. So I don't know, forty thousand dollars out of five million doesn't seem like such a big deal to me. But if you look at that for the huge companies that publish tons of games, especially mobile games, where there's millions of downloads, that adds up. That does dip into their revenue, especially a lot it, of free It does, games. and they and they probably spend a lot more, too. Yeah, because they have yeah. to work on retention and stuff, and a lot of that's ad revenue-based. So when you look at it that way, it does change the, the story a little bit. Uh, Unity is getting a lot of blowback from this. I don't know if they're going to backtrack or what what they're planning on doing here um their stock price went down three dollars after the announcement which i mean i guess ten percent basically you can expect something like that yeah wow. i don't know um the people at gumbo uh are, are sort of concerned valentina mentioned that she was concerned how this might affect publishers and their desire to publish games built in Unity. Um, it's someone else at Gumbo whose name I keep forgetting because I don't know him that well. Uh, thought that this is probably, in some respects, the end of Unity. So there has been some boycott, uh, boycotting that's already started happening among some of the larger mobile um, game developers. 
and they've stopped using Unity's advertising platform. So that's it's a choking ad revenue for Unity, um, which will cost them a good chunk of change, especially when with these companies they have a lot of games and millions of downloads. So he thought that it would drive the stock price down and Microsoft would snatch them up. Yeah. And I'd be okay with that because Microsoft actually is generally pretty good at managing uh, the tools that they acquire. Um, his other theory is that Google could snatch them up and that would probably be, in my opinion, not so good because Google doesn't do so good with their acquisitions. What does that mean for uh, for us then? Either way, like I don't know, right? Is is it possible to replatform Kids of Carinda without a monumental effort? No, it's not. We're not re- that that would kill the game. So we're staying the course. Yeah. So let's say if uh, Unity as a company dies within the no, next they, they won't two die. Years. They, yeah. They're not going to die. They could get acquired, and as long as the tools are still supported, who cares? Okay, that uh, makes sense. I mean, from, and I think Valentina's concern about publishers being less interested in publishing a Unity game is because that could be valid. But I think it really depends on how much the publisher thinks the game would sell. And then they would probably just take that into account for their share when you're negotiating their cut on the publishing deal. So I, I don't. I don't think a publisher would turn you away because of it, but it might just make the contract, if anything, look a little different. Okay. Um, do you think the this uh, policy change of theirs um, affects uh, mobile games more than PC? Or uh, I think yeah, because a lot of those games are freemium or free with ads. Mm-hmm. So if you're if you've got a million installs and you only have a very small percentage of those users who play the game regularly and yeah, correct, actually yeah. spend on in app purchases. Um, I think it's going to hit their revenue a lot more because if you're paying per install and you're only making so much money off a small subset of those installs. Yeah, because like I, I just think about, well, back in the day, how many different things I installed and uninstalled. Yeah, and... How do they like? How often do they charge? Like I, I that I, I maybe they've got that information published. Is it annually or is it one time thing? Yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't know. I wonder if people are going to look at ways to hack Unity, um, hack their builds so they can remove all the markers that that tell Unity that this was built by Unity software. Yeah, who knows? I'm, I'm sure someone will figure it out. Yep, and then I'm sure Unity, there'd be lawsuits and so on and so forth. Yeah, it was a probably risky move for them, but it's, it's, it sounds like they, they might be in financial trouble if they... Have well, they're not making things. money, yeah. um, which is why they need to discuss, determine a revenue model that will make them money. So, we'll see. Yeah, I'm not particularly worried about it. I don't think Unity is a tool is going anywhere, but who owns it, who supports it, I mean, it's got a a huge user base, like absolutely massive. It's like, uh, how does social media make money? Well, you end up being the product for social media, ad revenue. And that's, I think, how, how Unity was making some money. It, when, when I talk through it from that standpoint, I think Unity moving to this kind of model would make sense, but then I'd also want to see them lower licensing fees. You know, charges for the install. Then why you you because you're basically charging us twice then. Yeah, like you're doing it on top of the licensing for. Yeah, but and all all small uh, indies basically get it for free anyway. Like the personal version is free. I keep I, I I've lost track of how they license the product now. I can't even remember which license. I I pay for Unity, but I can't even remember which license I have. Is it uh? Is it a lot? Mm, it's about thirty bucks a month. Oh, that's not horrible. No. At this rate, it's going to be cheaper than streaming services. Yeah, it's true. All right, right. Gary. Shall we uh, wrap this up and then record our intro?
We shall. Okay. So thank you for listening, everyone. If you enjoyed this podcast, please like, comment, and subscribe. And I think, Gary, we will do maybe one or two more this year. Hopefully. Okay, yeah. Maybe. Yeah. Okay. Well, yeah. that's what we'll try to do. All right, everyone. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time. Peace.